Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Ryan Davis, and I am a junior studying economics here at the college, and I am the chair of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please congregate to the exit, or please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. You can also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag populismforum, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests, Steve Hahn, Michael Kazin, Elizabeth Sanders, and tonight's moderator, Alex Kazar. Welcome to the Kennedy School and to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. We're about to have an important discussion about American populism and politics. We're very fortunate to have with us uh, this evening a distinguished group of scholars who will help us to better understand the historical evolution of populism and by using that historical lens to better understand how populism is affecting our politics today. I want to thank uh, briefly a few of the people who've made this uh, event possible. The original idea uh, to have this discussion came from Harvard President Drew Faust, <laughs> who's with us this evening. Uh, thank you, Drew, for providing the impetus uh, for what I know will be a thought-provoking conversation. Uh, planning for the discussion was led by Bart Bonikowski, who is an associate professor of sociology at Harvard and the uh, chair of the Weatherhead Center's research cluster on global populism. Uh, by Danny Roderick, who is Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the Kennedy School and has been writing insightfully on this subject for two decades. Uh, and by Sarah Wald, my Chief of Staff, and I'm grateful to all of them for helping to set this up. I'm especially grateful to the moderator of this evening's discussion, uh, my colleague Alex Kazar. Alex is an acclaimed historian and the Matthew Sterling Professor of History and Social Policy at the Kennedy School. Alex's book, The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, won awards from the American Historical Association and the Historical Society, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. During 2004 to 5, Alex chaired the Social Science Research Council's National Research Commission on Voting and Elections. He has written books and columns and other articles on a wide range of topics in political and economic and social history. We cannot ask for a better moderator of this evening's discussion. I will turn this over to Alex. Please join me in welcoming him and our panelists, whom <coughs> he will introduce. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for the very kind invitation, and thank you to President Faust for having the idea for this uh, event. More than 40 years ago, uh, the great Southern historian C. Van Woodward, whose name may be familiar to, to some of you, wrote that, and I'm quoting, populism is a bad word in the current American political vocabulary and has been for a long time. The word he noted had been, and I'm quoting again, applied to a fantastic variety of phenomena and in sophisticated circles had come to be associated with that which is low, demagogic, retrograde, and irrational in the American tradition of democratic politics. Woodward also noted, remarkably, that a conference of international scholars in London in the late 1960s had updated a famous sentence from the Communist Manifesto to proclaim that a specter is haunting the world, populism, 1967. That specter is haunting us again in recent years as political, labels that, as political movements that are labeled populist have become prominent in the United States, Britain, and much of continental Europe, as well as other parts of the world. The label populist is almost invariably invoked not by the leaders or members of these political movements themselves, but by those who oppose them. A populist, for the most part, is something that you call somebody else. Um, and it, is, it remains associated with that which is demagogic, irrational, anti-elite, and anti-system. As Woodward noted, 
It continues to apply to a, quote, fantastic variety of phenomena, to movements on the left and on the right, with different ideologies, programs, and analyses of the sources of our current predicaments. The word commonly carries negative freight. But that was not always the case in the United States. And among historians and students of history in the United States, it has very different associations. That is because the first political movement to call itself populist anywhere in the world was a late 19th century movement of farmers in the South and the West of the United States that sought to free the political system from the grip of monopoly and what they called the money power. Uh, beginning in the Farmers' Alliances of the 1880s and continuing <coughs> with the People's Party, founded in 1892, the populace sought to build agricultural cooperatives, to ally with urban labor, to build a broad-based and active reform culture, and to reinvigorate American democracy. Not surprisingly, then, for many students of this history, particularly in the last 40 years, there has been much to be admired about populists, despite some noted and well-known kinks in their belief system, uh, that the People's Party flamed out at the end of the 19th century, after more than a decade of institutional innovations and electoral successes, electing governors, co members of Congress, and many, many different states, they were a powerful political formation, and, me and many people thought after the 1892 elections that they might very well be able to elect a president or play a major role in the 1896 presidential election. But they did flame out, in part because they were partially diverted, and this is an interpretive statement, uh, to the single issue panacea of monetizing silver. And the defeat of, of the People's Party, uh, its real collapse by the end of the 19th century, has loomed to many as a historic defeat for civic nationalism, uh, for egalitarian ideals, and even for social democracy. So what can that history, what can the history of 19th century American populism tell us or help us to understand about the phenomenon we are witnessing today? That's the question that led us uh, to gather together in this forum. And to comment on these issues, we've invited three prominent scholars, all of whom have written about the late 19th century and all of whom are engaged with contemporary issues as well. Now, lest you think by referring to three prominent scholars I'm including myself, or that I can't count, let me, uh, let, let me explain that the third prominent scholar, Elizabeth, Professor Elizabeth Sanders, is in Newark Airport. Uh, um, thanks <laughs> to the snows, we, uh, we do have an electronic hookup to her, uh, but she did not quite make it here. But let me introduce the, the three speakers at once in alphabetical order and then they will speak actually in reverse alphabetical order. <coughs> um, first, Stephen Hahn, professor of history at NYU, is the author of numerous books about the history of the South in the 19th and 20th centuries. Among them are The Roots of Southern Populism, Yeoman Farmers and the Transformation of the Georgia Upcountry, and A Nation Under Our Feet, Black Political Struggles in the Rural South from Slavery to the Great Migration, which won the Pulitzer Prize in history. Michael Kazin is a professor of history at Georgetown University and a prolific analyst of American politics and social movements. The most directly relevant of his many contributions is his book, The Populist Persuasion and American History. He is currently writing a history of the Democratic Party, from, presumably from the beginning to the end. Um, <laughs> Right. Uh, and last, Elizabeth Sanders is professor of government at Cornell. Although a political scientist, she comes from the happy branch of that discipline that believes in the importance of history. Uh, her research interests include economic regulatory institutions, political development in the United States, and social movements. She is the author of the very influential book, Roots of Reform, Farmers, Workers, and the American State, 1877 to 1917. Each of our guests <coughs> will speak for approximately eight to 10 minutes. 
guided by some general questions which were circulated in advance. And after they have finished, I might interpose a question or two, but whether I do or not, the floor will then be open uh, for questions uh, from the audience. So moving in reverse alphabetical order and hoping that our technology is working, let me welcome Elizabeth Sanders, who should appear in voice and perhaps in image uh, on our screens. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry not to be with you. I'd much prefer to be there than in the New York airport. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I was waiting to see if, if uh, so shall I start? With yes, my yeah. yes, please do. Please just populism. Go, just go right ahead. Uh, yes, well, you, you said so much in, in the introduction uh, that will hopefully shorten what I have to say. But I, I find myself very disconcerted about the discussions of populism today, dominated as they are by the anti-populist, uh, particularly Europeans, uh, who it seem to have acquired a patent on the term and written the first books on it, even though what they call populism is extremely different from what, uh, from the real manifestation of populism in the United States, which had a party, started as movements and became uh, a party, and took over and changed uh, the Democratic Party to a large extent and has had an enormous effect on our laws and institutions since then, uh, during the Progressive Era, during the New Deal, when most of what they had advocated finally came to pass. So one really hates to see the idea stolen to be used in such an inchoate, unspecified way to apply to an assortment of pretty unlikable leaders. Um, and populism, by the way, that had, had some quite remarkable, extremely intelligent leaders, uh, but they weren't very prominent because they really believed in democracy. And it was really a, a collective movement, not a leader dominant movement, which is one of the big problems with the way the term is used today. Um, so I, I'm really unhappy with the way it's used, and I, I wish, you know, if I had my druthers, I would just ban the word, I think, at this point, until it had some connection with reality. Um, and we did, of course, uh, invent populism as a party. I think parties generally are the, the shapers and inventors of ideological uh, coalitions, and that was true for us. So, so why can't we define populism? But our populist party is extremely different from from all the uh, the terminology that's used today. Just coming within a, a barely two decades after the end of slavery, it reached out to form a biracial coalition, including farmers and workers in the most prominent labor organization at the time, which was uh, the Knights of Labor, uh, blacks and whites, and women uh, who were welcomed there and were, were some of the, the most uh, dynamic speakers at populist rallies. So uh, this was really different from the way the term is used today. It was not nationalist. It was certainly not militarist. It was not sexist. Um, it was not anti-trade. In fact, there was a, a strong free trade orientation. Um, so it's just really hard to see the connection. And how do we take our populism back and, and preserve it for, for a very different kind of party? And the reason I'd like to do that is because what's happened in the last year and a half and all the discussions of populism have made me realize that the populist kind of party is quite antithetical to, say, Hillary Clinton's Democratic Party, what the Clintons made of the Democratic Party, uh, changing it from, from a party of have-nots, from a class-based party, to a, a sort of party of identities. And this was Clinton's strategy at the Democratic Convention, just to talk about all the different identities that made us up. But, but not much about policy, and her policy positions were a bit suspect because before she came in contact with a person I consider a fairly genuine populist in modern times, Bernie Sanders, uh, her positions had been very elitist. Uh, and she had continued the neoliberal hawkish orientation, the deregulatory orientation um, of Bill Clinton. So that, that kind of party, I just think, cannot survive and should not 
survive. If there's one good thing about Trump's victory, it's that he stopped the Clintonism a version of, of the left party and, and really destroyed any meaningful left party. Uh, so maybe now we can do it all over again in a different way. Um, if you look at the policies of Bill Clinton, I think it's very important to understand the past history, uh, the immediate past history of the Democratic Party to understand the so-called populist rebellion against elite politics. Because Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush, who were assumed in uh, 2015 to be uh, the, the nominees of, of their respective parties, really, you know, Tweedledum and Tweedledee, uh, backing the same kind of neoliberal, hawkish, uh, free trade, open borders, policies. Um, and, and that's really what people began to rebel against. Because if you look at what had happened as a result of Clinton's free trade, I put that in quotes, Donnie Roderick will know why if he's there. Um, it's because there wasn't much trade left to free up, but there's some really, really democratically uh, subversive of democracy portions to those treaties. Uh, but the, the, the free trade orientations of the first Clinton administration had really wiped out a lot of man, U.S. manufacturing. Uh, the, the Economic Policy Institute says about 700,000 jobs. Uh, and as NAFTA destroyed or seriously injured the Mexican agricultural economy, you got this huge surge of illegal immigration, which also produced competition with American workers at the very time they're losing massive numbers of manufacturing jobs. And then you throw in the economic uh, de deregulation, the financial deregulation that Clinton really pioneered, uh, doing more than, than either Reagan or I think George W. Bush to accomplish that. And what did that lead to? The crisis in housing, uh, which destroyed a huge chunk of wealth for people of very modest means billions of dollars of wealth that people never got back. You put those policies together, and it's, you know, why would you not get a so-called populist uprising? That is a democratic little d uprising against elite policies that were absolutely devastating to the working class. And we, you know, we sometimes single out the white working class, but nobody in the working class did well. It was an era that really promoted inequality. And what's odd to me is that before the election of 2016, we political scientists and sociologists had begun to talk so much about the evils of inequality, but then came that result. And instead of saying, ah, it must have been a socioeconomic result of, of extraordinary inequality and policies dominated by elites that were devastating for low-income people in the, in the lower half of the income distribution. But no, we didn't do that at all. Uh, so the, I guess the biggest problem I have with the use of the term populism today is that by making up some really vague definition that just applies to people we don't like but has no substantive policy content, and, and it's always unclear, does it just apply to leaders or are the masses assumed also to share these reprehensible uh, characteristics? By doing that, we take populism off the positive table and we can't use original American populism as a model for the reconstruction of the left party. Populism was to provide that model, uh, you know, cross cross ethnic groups, cross regions, cross genders, bringing people together across those divides for economic reasons and reasons of fairness and little d democracy and political reform. That's not a party of identities that does really nothing in the way of redistribution, but just gives people, you know, perhaps some kind of citizenship security in return for not doing anything for them economically. So I think this is a choice we face today. We have, yes, enormous unhappiness, and label it how we will. There are real reasons for that unhappiness. <coughs> if you just look at the situation uh, of of the working classes of the of the bottom half of the income distribution. And I think populism provides a really important alternative way to structure a left party and remedial policies to get us out of the hole we're in. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> you can hear us. Mike. Uh, thank you. It's a real honor to speak here. Uh, I think one of the reasons I'm here is because I reviewed very positively uh, Alex's two books. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, as before, I was, you know, invited. <laughs> um, 
Well, Elizabeth gave a real popular speech in many ways, uh, I think, in many, and, and I want to do something a little more... You're not going to call me a demagogue, are you? <laughs> 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 I'm going to do something a little more academic. Um, uh, three things I want to do in my, in my eight to ten minutes. One, I want to talk about how populism became what it is today, which is what philosophers call an essentially contested concept. Uh, that is, there are so many populisms, uh, nobody really owns the term uh, anymore, uh, the way the People's Party used to. Uh, and second, I want to talk about what I think are two different populisms uh, uh, which run throughout American history, uh, both of which are, you know, one of which is more left, one of which is more right, but those terms really don't describe them very well. And finally, I want to defend populism in somewhat different ways than Elizabeth did. So, first of all, how did we get to this point where the P word, uh, everyone can claim it, uh, as Alex said, a lot of people uh, use it uh, pejoratively, but uh, Steve Bannon, remember him, uh, uh, calls himself a populist, and, and uh, there are certainly people uh, in Europe who do as well. Um, how did this happen? Well, uh, until the 1950s, I think, uh, the term was used mostly by historians to talk about uh, the People's Party of the 1890s, to talk about some figures in all political parties uh, um, who had a lot of uh, sympathy with populism and spoke in similar ways. William Jennings Bryan, uh, the Democrat, Robert LaFollette, senator from Wisconsin, was a leading populist progressive. Uh, but in the 1950s, a group of liberal intellectuals decided to use one aspect of the populist thinking, their penchant for alleging a conspiracy by elites in both the U.S. and Europe, to explain Senator Joseph McCarthy uh, and his fellow Red Hunters, uh, who didn't, whose program had nothing to do with the original populists. They were these liberal intellectuals, including Richard Hofstadter, Daniel Bell, Sue uh, Martin Lipset, and others, argued that McCarthy and other ordinary white Americans who cheered him on um, were also indulging in conspiracy theories. Also, but their conspiracy theories were different. Uh, the populists, when they indulged in conspiracy theories, which they didn't do as much as um, the liberal intellectuals who were attacking them believed, would tend to talk about bankers and um, uh, politicians who were corrupted by the big money, as, as Alex mentioned. But McCarthy and his fellow Red Hunters, of course, talked about um, well-born, well-educated pinkos uh, or reds in the federal government. Um, and so this way of talking about people on the right as being populist as well as people on the left sort of started this whole new wave, vogue, you might say, of, uh, of calling people populist. This continued on to the 1960s um, because there were lots of different rebellions against the powerful elites in the 1960s, as uh, I'm sure all of you know. Um, you had people like George, George Wallace, the racist segregationist governor of Alabama, who ran for president um, four times, actually, but um, ran on his own ticket in 1968. Uh, and he was often called a populist because he said things like, um, this country would be better off if... Uh, a still work with a sixth grade education ran things instead of these, you know, uh, high, uh, Harvard, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Harvard intellectuals. Um, and at the same time, you had people on the left, um, like those in uh, Students for Democratic Society, a group I was in at one point, who talked about participatory democracy, uh, the people uh, should rule. Uh, you had people like Ralph Nader, uh, then a liberal lawyer who stoked a revolt by consumers uh, against auto companies and increased their profits by concealing design flaws in their vehicles. And journalists were looking for a way to describe all these rebellions. And populist was available. Uh, I think probably some of them had gone to school and read books by Hofstadter and Bell and, and Lipset and others. Um, so I think since the 60s, there's no way, at least in the way we use these terms today, to talk about who's a real populist and who's a phony populist. Um, but I do think you can look at two different, often competing populist traditions uh, that have long thrived in the United <coughs> States. They don't correspond exactly to left-wing or right-wing populists, but they have very different ways of understanding who the people are, who the elites are. Um, the first type is, I think, best uh, represented today by Bernie Sanders, maybe uh, your senator, uh, Elizabeth Warren, in many ways. Their populism directs their anger uh, exclusively upward at corporate allies and their enablers in government who have allegedly betrayed the interests of the men and women who do the nation's essential work. These populists a, embrace the conception of the people, uh, 
which is uh, based almost entirely on class. Um, and they avoid identifying themselves as supporters of any particular ethnic group or religion. Um, um, the historian Gary Gerstel talks about uh, two traditions in American thinking, civic nationalism and, and racial nationalism. And, these, and this more progressive uh, populist uh, tradition, I think, uh, adheres very much to a sense of civic nationalism. That we're all in this together, all Americans together. And when elites are betraying the um, ideals of freedom and equality and democracy, then the people as a whole, the 99%, if you will, uh, should uh, protest and try to get them to change their policies. The other populist tradition, I think this is the one our president uh, adheres to, uh, is I think has, has deep roots in American history as well. Um, in this tradition, uh, which adheres to a kind of racial nationalism or ethnocentric nationalism, the definition of the people is narrower and more ethnically restrictive. For most of U.S. history, it meant um, only citizens of European heritage, real Americans, quote, quote, whose ethnicity afforded them a claim to share in the county's bounty. Uh, this breed of populists looks at a conspiracy of sorts between those at the top of society and those at the bottom of society, and usually people at the bottom of society uh, with, uh, with darker skins. Um, this is a conspiracy, whether, whether actually real or alleged, uh, is less important than the fact that there's often a sense that people at the top, uh, elite liberals, business people, are exploiting the labor of those way at the bottom uh, who should just be kicked out of the country. And if that doesn't sound <laughs> like our <coughs> president, well. Um, now, both types of populists have from time to time gained political influence. And sometimes they're, that, the traditions mix. Um, one group that's kind of mixed them is a group that's not much talked about today. The historians have done a lot of good work uh, to describe it. The Working Men's Party of California. It was led uh, in the 1870s, it arose, uh, during a, a Great Depression in the U.S. It was led by an Irish-born uh, small businessman named Dennis Carney in San Francisco. The party was equally opposed to big business and to Chinese immigrants, who were charged were effectively the slaves of big businessmen. Listen to Carney. Um, just one quote is all I have time for. Our moneyed men have rallied under the banner of the millionaire, the banker, and the land monopolist, the railroad king, and the false politician to effect their purpose. A bloated aristocracy rakes the slums of Asia to find the meanest slave on earth, the Chinese coolie, and imports him here to meet the free American in the labor market, and still further, further widen the breach between the rich and the poor, still further to degrade white labor. So this is a populist anti-immigration uh, stand which goes back to the 1870s. And the Workmen's Party of California both was equally, the, pe the, the members of it, who are of course all white workers, were, and white small business people, were as angry and incensed at the power of the Central Pacific Railroad, major force in California politics at that time, as they were with the Chinese. Uh, they took over the state of California in the election of 1878. Uh, they put into place an eight-hour workday and tried to get all Chinese who were in the United States expelled, which they couldn't do as a state. Um, the party fell apart, but um, they did have one success after its demise. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, the first law in U.S. history to bar members of a specific nationality from entering the country. Um, now, there are many examples in, in, in my book, Populist Persuasion, of right-wing and left-wing populists using similar kinds of language. However, uh, uh, the, the so-called right-wing <coughs> populists, the racial nationalist populists, always talk about a threat from below as well as a threat from above. And look at the two sides uh, conspiring with one another against the broad white middle. Um, now, I think, as, as Elizabeth said, and I think uh, I'm sure Steve will say this as well, it's important to beware of, you know, the way populist language is used by demagogues, by racists, by uh, ethno-nationalists, uh, uh, like our president, like uh, many uh, people in Europe right now, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, uh, many other examples of that in Europe. But at the same time, to realize that populism, um, I think, as a language, can strengthen democracy, not imperil it. After all, the People's Party helped usher in many progressive reforms, such as the income tax, corporate regulation, 
that made the United States a more humane society in the 20th century. Democrats comfortable with populist language, from William Jennings Bryan to uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, did much to create the liberal capitalist order that most Americans want to dismantle. Excuse me, most Americans would not want to dismantle. <laughs> um, I don't think. <laughs> Now, obviously, populism has a, had a very unruly past. I mentioned some of that. Racists, would-be authoritarians, have exploited its appeal, as have more tolerant foes of, plut of plutocracy. Bernie Sanders talks about the billionaires this, the billionaires that. That's a form of um, uh, simplifying the uh, power relationships in American society. But in many ways, it's an effective one. But in the end, I think Americans have found no more powerful way to demand that our political elites live up to the ideals of equal opportunity and democratic rule to which they pay lip service during campaigns. So populism can be dangerous, but it is also necessary. And I'm also going to quote C. Van Woodward, <laughs> uh, the great um, uh, liberal Southern historian who was friends with Richard Hofstadter, Uh, and some of these other figures uh, who I mentioned before, but he disagreed with them fundamentally about uh, the nefarious impact of populism. He said in 1959, in a famous essay he wrote, <coughs> one must expect and even hope that there will be future upheavals to shock the seats of power and privilege and furnish the periodic therapy that seems necessary to the health of our democracy. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Steve. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it's a, especially a pleasure to share a podium uh, with Alex Kazor and Michael Kazor and Elizabeth Sanders, uh, whose work has taught me a great deal uh, about uh, not only populism, but about uh, much of the American past. Um, I've spent a fair bit of time uh, in my life as a historian uh, thinking about and teaching about and writing about uh, populism, especially in its late 19th century incarnation. Uh, for the most part, uh, I presented it in a sympathetic and favorable light and, and as a political phenomenon that could still speak to us uh, in what was then the late 20th and early 21st century. So. I'm going to part company a little bit with Elizabeth and Michael, uh, and it may be surprising for me to say that in my view, populism actually has very little uh, to offer any serious movement for progressive change, either in the United States or anywhere else. Uh, why do I think that? Um, 19th century populism was a movement and a political party, as both Michael and Elizabeth have uh, uh, said, that uh, emerged during the century's last decade, mobilizing farmers and some workers and building upon foundations of greenback and anti-monopoly struggles and sensibilities. Uh, which is to say that 19th century populism had a definable constituency as well as a program and platform uh, it wished to pursue. Populists then called themselves populists. Uh, they complained about the growing inequalities of wealth and power in American society, about how, as they would put it, independent producers had increasingly been relegated to what they called dependency by banks, creditors, and speculators, and they complained about the political corruption at all levels of government that enabled the transfer of wealth and power from the many to the few. And to remedy these uh, imbalances and inequalities, populists proposed uh, a variety of remedies to abolish privately owned banks and put the money supply under public control, to create a national system of cooperative marketing and purchasing, to establish government ownership of the railroads and, uh, excuse me, and telegraph, to enact a graduated income tax, to enable the free, what they call the free and unlimited coinage of silver, and to make the selection of United States senators uh, subject to popular election. Populism in the 19th century had its strongest bases of support in the South, in the Plains, and in the Rocky Mountain West. And in the South, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, there was some effort to forge a biracial alliance with African Americans who did remain politically active, though most uh, disposed to the Republican Party. 
Uh, the populists today, and we've been saying, are not part of any institutionalized movement. They have no recognizable uh, program or platform, and they don't call themselves populists. Uh, they're called populists uh, by the media and by political uh, pundits who are interested in grouping together people they see as angry at the political establishment and the consequences of globalization. They're thought to be older folks and their families living in declining or depleted uh, industrial towns or non-metropolitan uh, areas that have been bypassed by the information or high-tech economy. And they are almost always represented as white. Contemporary populism has come to signify the unbridled rage of un- or undereducated white racists who, rather than blaming economic elites as their predecessors once did, prefer to target an assortment uh, of enemies at home and abroad, most of whom are people of color and of foreign uh, birth. Populists today are regarded as the political base of the Trump administration, and they're often depicted as members of another constructed category, uh, the so-called white working class. Now, to me, it's really striking to see American political discourse so easily wrap itself around the influence of class when it has been uh, so long been devoted to denying the importance of class in American political life, at least if it's not middle class. Uh, it's striking, too, that the political logic associating, if not equating, populism with the white working class has been eagerly embraced by many analysts on the left, even without their exploring whether the concept is, is of any real use. The apparent uh, misbehavior of white working class folks, after all, allows us to see the current political situation as a deviation from our political traditions and permits us to absolve ourselves of responsibility for what is happening, indulging, as many have done, in what I would call the cultural voyeurism, uh, the class pornography that books like Hillbilly Elegy offer up. Uh, the road uh, from the populism of the 19th century uh, to the populism of the early 21st, and I uh, recommend to all of you Michael Kazin's Populist Persuasion, which is far and away the best on all this. Uh, it, it's a long one, but it bears some resemblance to the road from the 19th century idea of the working class and working classes to the 20th century notion of the masses. Now, the masses is an idea that the right has been central to advancing, though one that the left has also legitimated. It is an idea of an undifferentiated, as they would put it, glob of humanity, <laughs> uh, characterized by banal tastes, political pliability, hostility to culture, and general vulgarity, which nonetheless can be crucial to the success of mostly authoritarian regimes. And so contemporary populism took its form both uh, I think, from the defeat of the populist movement of the 1890s and from populism's increasing association with political phenomena that defy familiar categories but also showed the marks of popular energies and anger from the 1920s Ku Klux Klan to the backlash against the welfare state and multiculturalism. Not surprisingly, and M Michael uh, pointed this out, some academic scholarship in the 1950s um, depicted the Populist Party not simply as sort of the predecessor of McCarthyism, but as proto-fascist. And this was part of a general critique of mass politics that was being crafted by historians and social scientists uh, at the height and depths of the Cold War. And of course, like its 19th century predecessor, contemporary populism, oh, and, and, and of course, unlike its 19th century predecessor, contemporary populism appears to be winning, at least for now. Uh, let me um, just finish by uh, asking, what, if anything, can we learn uh, from the history of 19th century populism? And are there reasons for holding on to the political rubric of populism itself, despite its many contaminations. 19th century populism shows us, I think, the importance of developing a vision of the good society and of agitating at many levels for change. Populists were not backward looking. They wished to put the possibilities of a globalizing economy in the service of small producers through the mechanisms of popular politics and state intervention. They believed that economic independence was the basis of political democracy, 
and they embrace cooperatives as alternatives to unregulated uh, competition and market relations. They fashion policies and political outlooks designed to build some bridges between the worlds of agriculture and the worlds of industry, the dominant um, economic sectors in the 19th uh, century. Some of them even recognized that racial divides weakened their struggles and on occasion demonstrated how such divides could be traversed. Perhaps most important, they left a legacy of social democratic thinking uh, to progressivism and the New Deal. But, uh, at least as I see it, the history of 19th century populism also reveals problems that populists either never took on or never recognized as problems. First and foremost, populism in the 19th century was a movement of small to medium-sized property owners and of male household heads among them. They had no interest in addressing the relations of power within their households or how those relations shaped the public world of politics. And they had relatively little interest in addressing the relations of power at the workplace. Populists were also overwhelmingly Protestants who looked with suspicion upon propertyless laborers, especially those of different racial or ethnic origins, they saw them as threats to the republic as they envisioned it. They were supporters, um, as uh, Michael suggested about the Working Men's Party, uh, they were supporters of Chinese exclusion, and if you read their resolutions, as well as, as they put it, the further, uh, they supported the further restriction of undesirable immigration. Uh, and even if they were willing to appeal to black voters, they were rarely interested in empowering them or in understanding their aspirations. Not surprisingly, black support for populism in the South was episodic and almost never involved their embrace of the populist cause. African Americans had learned to view the sort of people who aligned with the populists as enemies and there was not much in the experience of populism to disabuse them. Most of the populist advocates of a biracial alliance went out of their way to discountenance what they called social equality between the races. And for the most part, they held contradictory ideas about the role and power of the state, often squaring the circles by personifying the state itself. The populism that has come down to us mostly carries the warts rather than the virtues of its historical predecessor. Populism is now associated with the palpable rage and willful ignorance of working folk by its hostility to democracy and its bent toward authoritarianism. Wherever it is to be found, populism is coded white. And although there are examples of populist movements or tendencies that have multiracial or multiethnic dimensions in other parts of the world, they are few in number and are far overshadowed by those that don't. Populism has never been a movement of the working class in the past, and it is unlikely to be one for the working class of today, even for the white element of the working class, which is often seen as populism's core. The American working class has always been multiracial and multiethnic, and save for a few decades in the middle of the 20th century, owing to Jim Crow, and immigration restrictions, the working class has always had limited civil and political standing in the United States. Populism, even in its radical left form, has eyed those we would regard as working class with suspicion. Although claiming to represent the people, populism historically has, <coughs> def has defined the people in a way that is problematic for a democratic popular movement of the present day one that requires the type of inclusivity that populists never uh, f um, favored or imagined. Uh, uh, be before opening uh, the, the floor, let me ask uh, our three guests, and I hope you can hear me, Elizabeth. I don't know why I'm looking up at the ceiling to, towards Elizabeth, <laughs> but, um, but uh, um, if, if there are questions that you would like to pose to one another, um, and if there are, or, or points you would like to address to one another. We have so little time, I'd rather, I'd rather back yeah, and forth. Oh, yeah. right. Okay, well then, why don't, then why don't we go directly to uh, 
questions from the audience. There are, we have four microphones. Uh, it's the, the usual drill for those of you who come here uh, uh, to the forum. There there, our rules and requirements are relatively few. We ask that you state your name uh, and sort of who you are, um, that your question be brief, um, which also implies that it not be a speech, populist or otherwise, <laughs> um, and that it end in a question mark. So let's start right here. Hi, uh, my name is Remy Hill, and I'm a sophomore here at the college. Um, and I have a question for Professor Sanders, I, who I believe can hear me. Yes, I can uh, hear you. <laughs> um, so I think we've heard a lot today, um, both from you and from others, about how the sort of this notion of the white working class is a little bit misguided and perhaps falls into a dog whistle trap. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent you think that positing sort of the like identity-based campaign that the Clintons put for, or Hillary Clinton put forth at the DNC as mutually exclusive with sort of more quote-unquote tangible policy as Bernie Sanders did when he said that we should move away from identity politics falls into a very similar dog whistle trap. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure where the dog whistle is, but I, I have come to think, and this is an idea very much in progress, in formation, I may change my mind, but it just seems to me seeing the links to which uh, Clinton was willing to go, and I think it was quite a deliberate strategy, the identity politics thing. It was based on, on uh, well, informed by or inspired by a book called Whistling Past Dixie, which was, you know, how can the Democrats do without the South and the white working class? Well, they can take in a lot of uh, upper middle class people, steal them from the Republicans, uh, particularly women, uh, and so on. Um, and, and then we wanted to do this class thing because the working class is unreliable when it comes to, you know, support for abortion and various kinds of moral issues. It's more religious. So just too hard to please them was the shallow idea. So let's just give up on that and not have a class-based party. I, I think class and identity are very different ways to form political coalitions, but I, but I, I don't, I think I don't want to say they're antithetical. If you look at the civil rights movement, you'd say at first, well, that's an identity movement. And yet, its mode of formation and operation and the secret of its success was precisely that it cut across class lines and ethnic lines and, and brought people together uh, on behalf of an idea. And the idea was equality. And that was seen to be, at that point, you know, a really American idea and we should live up to our ideals. And so it's the breadth, cutting across ascriptive lines uh, and being yoked together by principles and ideas. It's kind of what I mean by populism. Class politics is a, is, is a distillation of it and maybe not too accurate. But I would like to say to, to Stephen that that class is it's a difficult thing to pull off in this country, and it's a, a vast country and, uh, it, you know, racked by regionalism and all kinds of other things. But I still think that class, I guess I'm a Duvergerian in this respect, Maurice Duverger, who said, you know, you're always going to have a political split between the haves and have-nots. And you can slice that up, as they do in Europe, by having a multi-party system that, you know, will give you Catholic socialists and secular socialists and all kinds of different things. But he said, you know, what you're just trying to do there is, is to get around class, but it's still going to kind of ease, it's going to ooze up. And, and I sort of believe that. I, I think class-based politics is, po is popular politics because it is saying that the have-nots deserve to have their voice. And if they're the most numerous part of society, they should have the most, the most say in policymaking. And that's kind of the essence of populism. And I do think that it has some relevance today. But I, I wanted to say this to, to Stephen, and I think this relates to your question uh, too, uh, Rennie, that, that class is episodic. And in political science, we believe that there are you know, like five great party systems. And, you know, the New Deal party system was really an outgrowth of, of populism, very much informed uh, by it, uh, believed in labor unions uh, and government serving the people and capitalism has to have regulation. And just those basic principles, I don't think they're irrelevant today. I think when we do away with those, those kind of basic class principles uh, from populism to the New Deal, we really get in trouble. So I think that populism is relevant to bring back class and, and the, you know, the majority of the population having more say than a tiny minority of, of really wealthy people. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, I just wanted to respond uh, a little bit both to your question and to Elizabeth. I, I, I'm not suggesting at all that actually we should move away from class politics. I think class politics should be much more at the center uh, of American political life. Um, my feeling is both that uh, the class politics that has been represented is not class politics. It's white nationalist politics. Mm -hmm. And the so-called white working class as it's represented is only consists in part of people who are in what we would regard as, as the working class. The second point is populism is not a class movement. And if it's a class movement, it's a, it's a petty bourgeois uh, movement historically. And that means, too, that it, there's a great deal of volatility. It has moved left, it has moved right, and I think one of the reasons that we've seen this transformation, and also, uh, if you look in the historical literature, and the enormous changes in interpretation. You know, up into the 1930s, not surprisingly, uh, populism was seen in the kind of progressive historiography, historical mold as the people versus the interest. In the uh, post-World War II period, uh, that was also a time of cons consensus historiography, populism was seen as a symptom of the, um, you know, what happens to mass politics uh, with fascism in view. By the 1960s, with popular mobilizations, populism was cast in a more favorable light, in good part because uh, Southern populists did uh, make gestures toward African Americans that was really, you know, um, a, a breakaway in the uh, context of the developing Jim Crow South. Can we make a quick comment? Um, there's a lot to be said about this, you know, we can talk about class race forever, but I think it's um, um, politically mistaken to say that uh, people who are now being called the populist by working class are only um, animated by anti-immigrant attitudes or racial attitudes. Um, because I think, you know, they, as we know from lots of literature, I don't think uh, Hillbill Elegy is a good example of that, but, you know, they feel forgotten. They feel that other people have gotten ahead of them in line. Um, and, and also, you know, to some degree, you know, they're right that people who pontificate at places like this, you know, um, have, not been, have not been, you know, at least recently talking much about uh, the problems of people in Iowa who used to have good factory jobs and lost them to, uh, to immigrants through no fault of their own. They didn't bring the immigrants in. Um, so I think, you know, racial animosities and class animosities, racial, uh, racially based organization and mobilization and class based organization and mobilization, rarely do you have just one or just the other, I think. Um, I was trying to, you know, uh, point that out about the Workingmen's Party of California back in the 19th century. Uh, but I think, um, and even just really quickly, you know, uh, I'm not a great defender of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> um, she ran a wretched campaign. But she had a problem, which is that the Democratic Party is many different groups, you know. The Republican Party is basically, you know, white Christians. Um, and, and so, you know, she had an easier, uh, a much harder time, I think, putting them together. She did badly. But I think um, this is something Barack Obama was able to transcend, and partly because he was such a good speaker and so eloquent, and also he got lucky because he uh, was running in, 19, in 2008 at the time of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. But I think, you know, it's, it's a real problem for progressive uh, politics in some ways that you're such a heterogeneous party which has many different claims on it. Uh, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, let's go to our next question. Okay. Uh, my name is Braden Foldenauer. I'm a freshman at the college from Mississippi. Uh, my question is, given that many feel abandoned by the modern Democratic Party, do you think that a renewed left-wing populism has a future in traditional conservative strongholds like the Deep South? And if so, how do we go about, dis uh, how do we go about reclaiming those disillusioned by the modern Democratic Party? You're the Southern story. No, you're, well, you're, writing about, <laughs> you're writing about the Democratic Party. I mean, I think, I think um, you've got to try. I mean, I think Elizabeth's right that... that um, only with an interracial movement of working people, call them what you will, are you going to change this country in a progressive direction. Um, you know, you can look about the Doug Jones campaign in Alabama, uh, which actually, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton got a higher percentage of the vote in Mississippi than she did in Alabama, because uh, um, I guess there's more African Americans live there. Um, uh, but I think, you know, that, you know, he didn't talk about much about these issues, but it does show, I think, that that Democrats who uh, put together an interracial coalition can, can triumph. Now, the question is, if they do triumph, what do they do with it? You know, um, Bill Clinton and, 
and Jimmy Carter talked in some populist ways uh, as well. But in the end, in terms of policy, they didn't really build on that promise, I don't think. Um, uh, they were certainly, you know, not racist, and they were tried as much as they could, at least rhetorically, to put together black and white people, but they didn't really have an economic or social policy to do that in any kind of sustained way. Um, Can I say something about the, about the Alabama Senate campaign? I, I, I was terribly interested in that. And it, looking at the Doug Jones campaign, and, you know, he was the, what passes as a liberal Democrat in Alabama, uh, the, the National Party didn't give him much support. I suppose they didn't really think he had much of a chance. This is you know, one of the basic problems with the Democrats. They just assumed to be a party of, of big blue cities but, and, and not bother with Alabama. The, Doug Jones the liberal, uh, beat a guy that the media loved to call a populist, Roy Moore. And I thought, God, <laughs> why is Roy Moore a populist? Talk about, talk about this reputable people uh, who didn't seem to have a liberal bone of any sort in his body. I, I couldn't understand calling him a populist. Call him a demagogue. Call him a racist. Call him a pedophile. But not a populist. <laughs> but he was defeated in a quite remarkable way. Pedophile. And I, I do want to learn a lot more about this. I teach social movements. And I, something really remarkable happened. Because Doug Jones, I, I got an ad from him, uh, you know, a fundraising ad. And he said, you know, I hope you'll support me because, uh, you know, I can tell by my mailing list that you're a woman and I know you're really concerned most of all with LGBT rights and late-term abortion. And I just, I thought, God, you're not, you can't win in Alabama. Do you know where you are? You know, talk about populist issues, talk about economic issues. Well, he kind of never really got around to that. But it was taken away from him by African-American women. And they went out and they had the most populist, effective, uh, vote-getting operation. And I don't think they ever talked about late-term abortion and LGBT rights. They talked about economics, and they reached out to the white working class uh, and, and to women, you know, a special category there with, with objections to Moore and Trump. But, but these women put together an African-American populist campaign. And they talked, I, heard, I read just a little bit about their strategy. They went out and talked to white working class people about economics as a reason to vote against Moore. So I, I think it's possible, and it, it may come from a, a whole different direction. Um, so Steve, mm -hmm. do you want to come in on this? Well, you know, just, uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what a populist movement in Mississippi would look like, and I don't think that a movement simply that is uh, involves organizing sort of ordinary people around economic issues is by definition populist. Uh, one of the things I do know is that, you know, from my own work in the 19th century, those occasions when a real biracial coalition developed and was able to sustain itself, it took a long time, it took the development of trust on both sides, and it took a uh, understandings on the part of white and black people of what they actually wanted rather than constructing some notion about what the other uh, might be interested in and why they should join. Uh, it did happen. It didn't happen very much. And I think it is important for us to understand that when we're looking at any kind of what I, I would call a broad progressive coalition, it is going to have to be led in good part by people of color in this, in this country, by people who have been immigrants, and by women who understand power in the most basic ways that we, uh, we and I would add, populism has almost utterly ignored. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Question up there. Yeah, Jay Gleason. Um, <clears throat> Hillary Clinton had another problem. She was an ardent interve interventionist. She was virtually a, a closet neocon. And uh, Trump actually ran to the left of her on uh, foreign policy in the sense of uh, being very anti-interventionist. And there's been a long populist tradition in this country of uh, anti-war movements, going back at least to the Mexican War, draft riots in the Civil War, anti-sedition laws in the fir First World War, a big and underreported anti-war movement in the Second World War. And the populists have actually tapped into this strain as well. It's uh, not as uh, widely recognized, but it's the so-called progressives and establishment uh, politicians that have done most of the harm in foreign policy. So whether or not populists can be uh, uh, usurped by uh, these same uh, uh, forces that are embedded in the you know, security complex or not is another matter. But by talking uh, more anti-intervention... We want to get to the question mark fairly soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then the populists are actually uh, 
responding more to the will of the people and so-called progressives that are always involved in these uh, foreign wars of choice, aren't they? I completely agree with everything you said. <laughs> Anti-militarism <laughs> is a really important part of, of the next wave of populism. Michael, you want um, to? Well, I, I wrote a book last year called War Against War, which is about the American opposition to World War I, and a lot of the people who oppose that war um, as I said, I'm, I'm loath to call them populists, but they certainly use populist language a lot, like William James Bryan, like Robert La Follette, um, uh, like many others, including socialists and anarchists and, and many others. But, um, you know, but I think talking about that tradition today um, is difficult because, after all, you know, we do have the largest military in the world. Uh, we're the largest economy in the world. And um, I certainly agree with you, you know, that... Uh, uh, many, many, not all American interventions abroad militarily uh, have, been, have been mistakes, um, but at the same time, uh, rolling that back is a whole lot more difficult, actually, than, than uh, talking about a more populist economic platform. Um, in part because, you know, uh, the military is... Um, a lot of people go in the military, it's a pretty good job if they don't get killed or wounded, of course, uh, and they come from a lot of the areas that voted pretty heavily for Trump. In fact, rural areas um, and uh, um, you know, areas more in the South where medical care is not very good and so forth. And of course, as we know, you know it's a cliche, but the military is the most socialist part of, of the American economy. Um, look at the Veterans Administration, which uh, uh, this guy Shulkin just got fired as head of the VA because he was opposed to privatizing it. And all the veterans associations, which politically are not on the left in any other way, but they want government-funded health care for veterans, and that's very popular. So I think what you're saying is right, but, but I'm not sure there's a populist versus progressive uh, conflict there. I think we're going to the last question now. Um, and please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Noah Sleeper. Um, I'm wondering, uh, just sort of given some of the more uh, dire predictions of um, automation and sort of the adoption of machine learning technologies, if you think that would have room for a populist movement response or a response or a movement calling itself populist or if that's sort of too narrow an issue to build a movement around? That's a tough one. Um, I, mean, I again, think it's definitely I, going to expand the working class, <laughs> the vulnerable dependent class. I, I, it could be absolutely devastating. And, and that, you know, it's another thing about Clinton. She, she was all in favor of technology and robots and, and algorithms uh, taking over many parts of our economy. It, I don't I mean, what do you do about this? You're going to start by putting several million truckers out of work, and then you're going to move on from there. I think this will be a boon to populism, to a new class-based politics, because there are going to be so many vulnerable people out there. Uh, the, the problem with class-based politics is if the... If the the core of that class-based politics are people without jobs. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very different kind of class-based politics than you had in the 1930s, for example, where people were unemployed, but the people who were you know, behind the labor movement actually did have jobs. You know? um, and the economy was slowly getting better. Um, you know, there's all, this gets beyond the topic, but there are all these people who talk about univers, uh, universal basic income and you know, various ways to uh, smooth uh, the economic situation for people who won't be able to find jobs. But... You know, I, 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 was, I was talking to a student the other day who says, uh, and this is, I go to teach at a fancy university, he said, you know, maybe I'll end up working in China. There's probably better jobs there. So I'm, I'm sort of, um, I wonder whether my grandchildren will end up, um, you know, migrating, being immigrants to China or to a place like that, or India, which is actually, uh, will still be booming economically. One I thing I think that is important recovering about the populism of the late 19th century is that it was a critique of proletarianized labor. And it was, uh, it organized itself around an idea of economic independence. And it was, uh, you know, in part about quality of work, the dignity of labor, and the quality of life. And these are issues, it seems to me, that, you know, populism can and should speak to us, not simply as a resignation but as a way of fronting you know, the importance of the kind of work we do and the meaningfulness of that work that should be uh, an important part of what you know, movements struggle for. Well said. 
Well, uh, let me bring this to a close. Now, now I think the subject is entirely clear <laughs> to everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what we mean by the term populism, how we should use it, how the present connects to the past. We've managed to do this in an hour and six minutes, um, thanks to our remarkable panel. Uh, please join me in thanking our, our three panelists, uh, St Steve Hahn, Mike Kazin, and Elizabeth Sanders. And I and thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs>